family? How's everybody doing? Yeah, all right, all right. We are that excited that you're here and even more. Whether you're joining us online or right here, welcome home, New Passion. It is great to see you. I'm Phil. I'm blessed to get to be part of the leadership team here at New Passion. But most of you know today I'm here to tell you about the awesome stuff going on around campus and to welcome our guests. So if you're a guest with us today, welcome. Welcome to our home. We are very, very excited you're here. But here's the deal. The only way we're going to know you're here is if you tell us. Now, hopefully we've made that really easy. And unless you snuck in the back door, you were probably handed a Connect card on the way in. What we'd ask is at some point today before you leave, if you would fill out that Connect card. And if you did sneak in the back door, there should be some in the seat back pockets in front of you. And then when you do dismiss, we dismiss at the end, you see there's red and white arrows. Most of the New Passion family is going to go out the back door and just kind of fellowship out in God's beautiful open country back there. But we'd invite you to stay inside. Hang a right, go back out through the main lobby, and then meet us up front. There's big signs that say VIP first-time guests. And we just want to say hi, give you a fist bump. Thank you for coming out. If you are a first-time guest with us, we'd like to give you a T-shirt that kind of says who we are. It's our, it's our DNA. It's as people of the second chance. Because at New Passion, here at New Passion, Everybody is always welcome, regardless of your hurt, your habit, or your hang-up, or what chance you're on. So that's our gift for you. And if you're a returning guest, there's a little block that says returning guests. And returning guests could be your second time back or your, your hundredth time back and you haven't done so. Please check that block as well and meet us out front. We just want to say hi. And we'd like to bless you with Right Now Media. And what Right Now Media is is an online compilation of different Bible studies and other enriching content to help you become that passionate follower of Jesus Christ, which is our goal here, to make passionate followers of Jesus. And that's our gift for you just for coming out. And if you're joining us online, we'd like to know you're here as well. So you can open, open up a new browser tab, go to newpassion.family, that very top button that says connect with us. All that is is a digital version of that. Fill that out, and as soon as you click submit, the power of the internet's going to bring it here, and somebody this week's going to reach out and say hi. But in the meantime, we're also going to get you signed up for Right Now Media as our gift to you. Now, I know that's a whole lot of details for everybody, so if you're here, just meet us out in the main lobby. And if you're online, just say hi, open up a window, shout out, newpassion.family. Our new passion, there's a ton of things going on around campus. It is, we're moving into spring, and it's going to be a fantastic time. Coast, coming up on March 13th, first for all the men out there, we've got a men's breakfast coming up next Saturday. It's going to be fantastic. There's going to be lots of great food, but there's going to be a really wonderful message. I know the gentleman who's bringing it has been working on it hard, and he's a great speaker, so I know you're going to enjoy it. So do me a favor and get signed up and come out for that. And then all of the New Passion family, we still need your help. We're doing Party in the Front. It's our outreach. So when you guys came in today, there should have been two cards, two cards in your seat. Party in the Front and Celebrate Easter here at New Passion, and they're tied together. So what we'd like to do, we invite you to take those cards. And I know someone's in your mind right now. So who's in your mind? That's who you're going to give the card to. Find them this week. Invite them. Invite them to the party at the front. It's an outreach. It's for the whole community. Just to tell everybody, hey, we're thankful to be here. We just want to love on the community and just be the light here in the middle. And then we're going to invite them back at the end of that. And that's going to be celebrate Easter. So Easter this year is the first weekend in April. Get people invited. Whoever's in your head right now, that's who you're going to invite. And we're going to have an awesome Easter service. So take these cards and go invite somebody. And if you signed up to volunteer at the event, the party in the front event. There's going to be a quick meeting right after service right up here. Fancy's got some stuff to put out. But for the rest of you who haven't signed up, this is another call. We need you. We need your help. Help us be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? So you don't have to have signed up. Come to the meeting right after this. we got lots of places to plug you in. All right, New Passion, that's all I've got for you guys today. If you want to stand up, dust off the week. Man, the worship team was on fire at the earlier service, and I know it's just going to continue now, and this message was fantastic. So y'all hold on, and let's have a great week. Remember, God loves you, new passion, and so do we. Good morning, church.
Well, good morning, church. great time to be together as a body of believers. I don't know what your week's been like, but here we are together to celebrate as a family of God. And it's great to know that through everything, through anything that's been going on, that God has a greater, bigger future for us. We have eternity with Him that He's made a way for us to be there with Him. And when we really put that in perspective, it makes the things of this life seem small. I know we can feel, feel the realness of today. But let us, let us hope in our tomorrow with Jesus. Y'all know this song, well, you might have heard it. It's kind of new to us as a church, but let's sing along with me. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it long. I hear your invitation to let your go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. Come on, I run to the Father.
Y'all sing it one more time. Come on. Run to the bar, fall into grace. No reason for high, no reason to wait. No soul need to search, no soul need to pray. So I run to the fire God who can run to you, right? Let's pray, church. Our God, we, we thank you that we can go to you over and over. God, that you are a God that hears us. You listen. You have a purpose for us. Today, Lord, we just want you to be glorified, Father. And I pray that we just hear your word as the message comes today. And help us to walk out of here with something brand new, something that we can just, one more thing, God, that we can praise you for. We love you, our Lord Jesus. We praise you for all you've done. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again. I'm Phil, and isn't it awesome to have a father that you can just run to no matter what? Thank y'all. Again, incredible. Well done. Um, so I am Phil, as I said, and we get to, it's an honor to get to be out here with you guys as we continue to worship, and we move into the, the phase of our, our worship service, the giving portion, where we, we give cheerfully, and we're just thankful for all the partners that we have, everybody that's here, and just the times, talents, and treasures that you guys continue to give to us time and time again. So thank you so much for partnering with New Passion. If you normally give through check or cash, we invite you to plant your seed on the way out at the lock boxes in the back, wherever God lays it on your heart. And if you normally give online, you can go to newpassion.family or newpassionchurch.com. I'm sure it's up behind me or will be in a second. There's multiple ways to give. And we're just thankful. So I'd encourage you. I want to encourage you to continue to give. You know, he loves that cheerful giver. And so by your giving, we get to do so much stuff. New Passion's involved so many places. The body, the church, the big C but the little seed that is new passion. So thank you, whether it's with the Voice of the Martyrs, which is the persecuted Christian church, and we'll talk about it in a second, or even the local food banks here, the local churches here, stuff across the state. It's all because of your giving. So thank you, and thank you for that. Um, this, you know, as we partner together to pray for the persecuted church, this, this week, week we're, we're praying for Vietnam. And I know Vietnam can elicit some emotion from folks. That's a word that, you know, 30, 40 years ago definitely was a, was a bad word almost. But, you know, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And... You know, we've prayed for a lot of church. We've been in Southeast Asia the last couple, couple weeks, and we're going to continue to pray for Vietnam. I was uh, reading the, the form that you can download at newpassion.family. It's the persecuted Christian form. And I was, well, I'm going to tell you an earlier story first. Shelly and I were talking about some, some people in Iran, and I didn't know it, but mostly around the world, outside of the U.S., it's women. It's women that lead, the women that speak for Jesus, the women that go out and, and they go there for, and they're the ones who lead their families. And then I was reading about Vietnam. It's on the very first page. In Vietnam, it's punishable. You will lose your children if you're a woman and you become a Christian and you try to spread the gospel. So what kind of faith is that? What kind of faith is that? You know, we get worked up over, and I don't want to steal too much from later, but on what time and what we're going to do and everything. But these folks really are truly willing to die. We learned about the other countries previous times. And now Vietnam, they will lose their family. I see lots of mama bears out there who would die in a ditch in a heartbeat for their, their children. And so I encourage you, we have to partner. We have to pray for these. These are our brothers and sisters. Um, so no matter what emotion you may have towards Vietnam, and maybe it's none, and that's fantastic. But every day, we have to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world because they don't have it like we do. They're not in a warm building where it's dry and where they can talk freely and worship God and hear a great message and then, then go there for and tell other people. It's punishable by death. So I encourage you, sometime this week, talk to your family. Talk to your, your friends. Talk to somebody about our persecuted brothers and sisters, and then, and then pray pray for them. And we're going to do that here in a second. And I just invite you to, to join me as we do that. We'll pray for the church and basically anything else that probably God lies on my heart at this point. But I want to just encourage you and thank you for sharing your times, talents, and treasures here. And uh, just trust in the Lord with all that you do. So if you'll please join me in prayer. Father, we come to you with a grateful heart, with a thankful heart that you have paved a way that you sent Jesus to die for every one of our sins, every one of them. 
And that because of that, we can come directly to you. And that you're intercessing, or Jesus is intercessing on our behalf to you, Father, at all times. And we come to your feet right now. We lay new passion. We lay the finances. We just pray for the leadership that you would show us how to be good stewards of the time, talents, and treasures that people so willingly give for you, Father. And that you would just direct us and guide us and show us, point us in the direction that you want us to go, Father. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for the staff that is here at New Passion. We thank you for the families that are here that are represented. The larger families, though, those that aren't with us, our extended families, our brothers, sisters, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, friends, everybody, the big C church, Father. We're thankful. We're thankful that we are all one with you and that you have made a way to call each one of us son or daughter. So Abba, Daddy, thank you. Thank you for loving us when we didn't deserve to be loved. Thank you for calling us your own, for knitting us and making us just the way we are, Father. We pray. We pray for Vietnam. We partner with the missionaries and our brothers and sisters in Christ in Vietnam right now. We lift them up to you that you would, that you would protect them, that you would guide them, that you would shield them, and that you would use them to light a fire in Southeast Asia right now. That you would bring that country on fire for you and a great revival would start in your name due to their dedication and their willingness to go there for, to answer the Great Commission, Father. We thank you for them. When we lift them up and we partner with them this week, we will think about them, Lord, as we go about our daily business. But we just thank you for men and women who were willing to go there for whether it be Vietnam or anywhere else in this world, Father, there are folks that are willing to talk about you and that we get together, we disciple one another, and then we go tell people the good news, Father. So just encourage us, give us the strength and wisdom to do that, to do your work, Father, and be with us. Be with our families. Let us have a wonderful week. Bless everything that we do, Lord. Keep us pointed in the direction you want us to go and shield us from those things that you don't want us to do. We love you, Lord, and we are so thankful that you've called us yours and you love us. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, you are the master and creator of the universe, the God of all nations. You are the Lord who hears our prayers. We give thanks to you for your everlasting love and faithfulness to those who put their trust in you. We come to you today, Lord, to pray for our beloved country, Vietnam, a country that was torn by war and poverty. But we thank you for your deliverance. We pray for the current believers in Vietnam right now, where there is still persecution because of their faith in you. We ask that you strengthen their faith and help them to stay strong in the midst of many trials. We know that through trials and tribulations, it brings us closer to you, Lord. Help us to be bold and stand up for what we believe and know that our reward is not here on earth, but in heaven. We patiently await for your power to transform the government, to allow more freedom of worship, more churches to be built and to rid our country of the idolatry and evil spirits that is suppressing our people from your love and truth. We pray for the salvation of the Vietnamese people, Lord. There are so many lost souls who have never heard of the gospel. Please open the door so many missionaries can come to Vietnam to share the message of your grace, love, and forgiveness. Allow the Vietnamese people to see the light, hope, and new life that the gospel brings them. The harvest is plenty in Vietnam, Lord, but the workers are very few. We pray for the unity of many Vietnamese churches to train and disciple a new generation of leaders to help convert our nations of over 80 million unbelievers. We know this task is enormous and overwhelming. We cry out to you, Lord, at this time to have mercy on us and our people. Give us an opportunity to repent ourselves from the materialistic world and take on the burden of the cross throughout Vietnam. May we be a nation that seeks you and hunger for your love and grace. Equipped us to serve you faithfully and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
Hey, New Passion family, I cannot wait to be back with you this coming Sunday, March 14th. In fact, if you've signed up to volunteer um, it, during the event this Saturday, the party in the front, uh, I'll probably see you then as I plan to stop in briefly and to say hello, to meet the community, and just to be a part of what's taking place. I know a lot of people have been putting forth a lot of effort to make this a success, and so thank you so much for those who have volunteered. I hope others will jump in. This is a great opportunity to make connections with our community before Easter, and so hopefully I will see you then, but I can't wait to be back with my church family. I have missed you guys, um, but it has been a great time of refreshment and rest over these last seven weeks. And so thank you for giving me this time away. But also, I am so grateful for the men who have stepped up, who have uh, preached for you and who have helped lead in these times. And so thank you guys. Uh, it, there have been some really great messages. And so uh, I'm so thankful for that. I hope that you're grateful as well. It's been great to be able to tune in online and to be able to hear the messages and be fed myself. And so I look forward this coming Sunday to see you once again. But today, uh, for the, the final week that I am out, I am so excited to be able to introduce you to my friend, my brother in Christ, uh, a great guy, someone who was there for uh, my family and for me uh, in a time uh, of transition, in a time where we just need some, some spiritual rest and spiritual healing. Uh, my friend, uh, Pastor Chuck Gordon, uh, he is starting a new ministry called Connect Hope, and I'm excited for him and what God's doing in his life and his family's life. They've been such good friends of us. Many of you know them. They're good friends of yours. And I hope that if you don't know them, that you will meet them today and that they will become a friend of yours as well. They love Jesus with a passion. Um, that's the one thing that uh, when I met Chuck, man, I loved uh, his love for Jesus. I loved his passion for the local church um, and the gospel. The, he is the real deal. And I love Chuck Gordon. I cannot wait to hear what God has to say through him uh, as he shares God's word with you today as we continue the, this series through James. So, New Passion, give Chuck Gordon, my friend, your friend, a warm welcome, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Appreciate encouragement, man. I appreciate encouragement. I, I want to call up as we begin a little differently, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to join with me and stand up. Um, and uh, this is going to be a little different in that I'll ask you, let's see if we have the verse on screen, um, I would ask you to, to read this with me, but a little different. I'm going to ask you to read it with me like it's a wedding vow, like you mean it with all your heart and soul. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my, is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is one of my all-time favorite passages in the world. It's my life verse, I guess you might say, because I believe this. Anytime you spend time in God's word, whether it be a devotional, whether it be being a part of a Sunday service, whether you just, you're just memorizing a verse, anytime you spend time in God's word, it will never, ever return to God void. It's going to speak into your life. It's going to change your life. It's going to transform your life. And this morning, as, as we dig in God's word, my prayer is not to remember anything I say. My prayer is that you remember what the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And anytime any one of the pastors here speak, that you listen as they share God's word, because it will transform your life. Let's pray. My Jesus, again, I just thank you that your word will speak. It never returns to you void. I thank you, God, for what you're about to do in some lives. It's going to change their life forever. And I thank you, God, that, that I have nothing to do with it. it, it I can't claim something so magnanimous. I also can't claim to fail when, when your word speaks. You're going to change lives. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that each of us take every next step you call us to take during this time. May you be glorified, Jesus Christ, in your precious name. Amen. Y'all can grab a seat. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, y'all got your exercise this morning. All right, so we started off. Um, again, I'm Chuck Gordon. Uh, so honored to be here. My bride and I moved b- here back in 1991, a long time ago. I'm from Florida. She's from Marietta. We met in college. Um, we've been married 31 years, and so, so incredibly blessed. I know it's hard to believe it with me only being in my late 30s, but anyway, that's a whole other story. But no, we, we um, again, uh, so blessed. We have three daughters. Our, our oldest is a, a Georgia Tech grad. I grow, I'm a Florida Gator fan. I'm sorry if I offend anybody here, but got to say that so I know, boo. Anyway, uh, she's a Georgia Tech grad. She's, a, she's actually a graphic designer for a Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, our, our middle daughter graduated from Georgia Southern. She's a, a discipleship and missions intern uh, at Life Church in Norman, Oklahoma. And um, our youngest is a Georgia Tech student right now. And so, again, very blessed. I never, we never dream we're moving here and our daughters have moved to Oklahoma, all right? Now, who, do, who you know, plans that? But God in his sovereignty knows what he wants. He knows what's going to glorify him. And, and it's so blessed to be here. Got to meet Nick and Nikki back in uh, 2006. Uh, we were just a couple years into uh, our church plant, and we met them. And, of course, my first thought from my wife and I is, we didn't know that couples were allowed to marry in middle school. But, I mean, they just looked so young, you know, and, just, they, and that's, that's them. And, but we absolutely love Nick and Nikki. They've been such a humongous blessing in our lives. Um, and my wife has been a part of the Bible studies that Nikki's been having on Tuesday nights. And if y'all are missing it, ladies, you're missing out. It's been phenomenal. Um, I, I speak that because my wife, you know, knows it, and she shares about it when she comes home. But this morning, that said, we, we're going to dig in God's Word. We're going to keep on digging. We're in James chapter 4. Um, and I hate that I'm following up with Jonathan because Jonathan just knocked it out of the park last week. Um, if you missed it, you're messed up. All right, Jonathan talked about being judgmental, but I'm sorry, I get to judge you on this one. Y'all need to listen to God's word and, and as it spoke. And each of the guys that spoke over the last many weeks, just powerful messages. Um, but we're digging in James chapter 4. And the background you probably got from the beginning of this series, just looking at James. James was talking to Jewish believers. These were Jews that had followed Christ. These were, there were Jewish, these were Israelites of the truest form, but they had submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But the crazy thing about them is much like us, though they came to Christ and though they were Jews, they knew the background, God's history, God's legend of, of all he did leading up to Jesus Christ's coming, they had a lot of baggage with them. They were following Jesus Christ, but yet they were bringing their baggage with them. They were following Jesus Christ, but they had their practices coming with them. And those practices were keeping them from experiencing the power of God in their life. And it's with that background we're coming to James chapter 4, verse 13. And let's go ahead, and I've got to put my old man glasses on here, so excuse me, guys. Here we go. So it says this, uh, 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what, uh, what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's talking about something called control. And anybody in here, let me kind of lay out a situation and see if you can relate. Have you ever had a situation where you've been at a friend's house or a restaurant or out shopping and your child had a meltdown? How in control were you? Stop it. Okay, yes, Mom. No. We had to leave multiple times. I love my daughters, and they're probably going to listen to this and be so mad. Dad, why do you share an illustration about us? But anyway, it it happens. It shows us how in control or out of control we are. I wonder how many of us here, you on your way to church, maybe it's been years past, maybe it was this morning, you were late because somebody else in the house had a little more control than you did. Or actually, they had loss of control, and it took them longer to get ready. And you went outside, and either you honked the horn, God forbid you honked the horn to tell them let it go. Or, or maybe you, on the way out the door, slammed the door loud enough where everybody else in the house could hear it, knowing that you're in the car waiting. All right? It just shows us we're out of control, doesn't it? We're out of control. This, this t- today, as we're digging in James 4, um, simply calling it this, don't miss. All right, don't miss, and I'm going to give kind of some don't misses here. And and what I'm going to be sharing is is from this context, I'm a student of God's word. I'm a student of following Jesus. I'm much like Paul. Paul said, I've not already attained all this. Paul, who was, you know, we see he wrote most of the New Testament. He, He had it together, but yet he's like, I haven't arrived, guys. 
and I'm so much not there. I have so far to go. So that said, I want to encourage you, like being in, in high school, you know, don't copy off my paper because I'm not doing that good. All right, I'm still learning. You know, don't, don't try to copy and think you can get all the answers right because I'm still learning. I want to challenge you to dig in God's word and learn from this because it will not mess you up. We're all going to make mistakes. But the first point, and simply want to dig in with this as we're looking at James 4, 13 and 14, is this. Don't miss God's call on your life because you're trying, again, to control your life. Don't miss God's call on your life because you're trying. Notice, emphasize, trying. You're trying to control your life. All I have to say with this one, very simple illustration, I believe many of y'all can relate. I can give you one number and one word, and, and you will recognize, yes, I have no control. 2020. COVID. All right, end of, end of a message. Y'all have a great Sunday. Thank you very much. Guys, how many of us had plans this past year to just... Anybody in here? The rest of y'all lying, or you're hermits, and you like to live alone, and you don't plan anything. All right, y'all are boring. Why are you, what are you doing here at church? No, no, we, we all had things go by the wayside. We had a humongous family vacation planned. Guys, white sand. I mean... Beach, beautiful, and that week that we were going, absolutely gorgeous, according to what weather.com uh, recorded. Uh, we were going to go eat out at some of my favorite seafood restaurants, and I was going to order grilled shrimp so I wouldn't get the fried stuff because I was trying to be a little healthier, all right? I'd already committed to that. Out the window, we don't have control. And James is trying to point out, we, we don't have control. Who are you to say I'm going to live this way or that way when we don't have control? And I wonder how many of us were missing out on God's call in our life because we're trying to control our life, the direction it's going, the trajectory of our life. And, and here's where the struggle gets. And James talking about a dichotomy, a, a, a dual lifestyle that, that the Jewish believers at the time were living that I believe applies to us, sadly, is this. God, I've got you here. Yeah, I'm going to tend church. I'm going to attend synagogue. I'm going to do whatever. I'm going to attend this worship gathering. I'm going to be a part of this. But over here, I've got my, my career and my hobbies and, and my investments and, and everything else. Oh, yeah, God, I, I, I will come to that men's gathering. I, I will do the women's Bible study. But I've got my life over here. You understand what I'm saying? He's saying, in essence, too often, this is what is happening with, with Jewish believers in Christ. And I believe it happens with us. We tend to categorize, again, this is my Christian part of life. The rest of this is mine. And I can make plans with all of this because this is the other part. You know, God, I've given God that corner, that little space, but I get to plan out this. Seriously? There's something about following Jesus Christ. It's basically saying they're not two separate lives. Either they're one or they're none. Either we're following Jesus or we're not. Jesus Christ will not be content with a corner of our life. He'll not be content with a Sunday service. It's either he's our life or he's not. And some of us, I believe, if I'm honest, and again, I, I'm going to shoot straight with you. I have nothing to lose. And all he says is don't come back and preach again. You know, it's like, here's the goal. My desire is I want you to know Jesus and I want you to grow in him that's my heart's desire. I know it's Nick and Nikki's. I know that's their passion and the staff that are here. They love you and they want you to take every next step. I, I want to encourage you with this. Don't miss what God, God's call is on your life because you're trying to control your life. If I can just take care of, no, no. What if you surrender it to God and say, God, this is yours. I want God to have this. So, so what about the expression uh, that basically when you fail to plan, you plan to fail? So we shouldn't plan at all? No, 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 no. The problem is not in, in planning. The problem is planning but disregarding God's will. The problem is planning, going about my life. We're going to make these investments. We're going to buy this thing. We're going to spend time. I'm going to pursue this career. I've seen marriage after marriage crumble, and I'm just being real. It's not always this way, but I've seen so many marriages crumble when a person says, well, we're going to take this, this pursuit of this career and I know I'm going to be away from my family, blah, blah, blah. And I know that we're going, to, but we're going to get together these weekends, however many times a year. And I've just seen marriages dissolve. Did God really intend that? Does it mean it can work? Yes, it can work. You've got to work at it if God leads. But we divorce God from the rest of our life and we expect God to bless it? 
It doesn't work that way. It never works that way. According to God's word, it can't work that way. But the truth about God's word is simply this. Um, For many of us, we've got to recognize that God is not going to lose control. In fact, God is the author of all eternity. And as a result, he wrote you into eternity for his purposes. And, And if you're not going to comply with his purposes, God is not going to, I don't believe he's just going to flat out punish, you know, here you go, I'm going to smite you. No, God's basically saying, I'm going to get things back in control. And I like how Warren Wearsby put it, basically, when God cannot rule, he overrules. When God cannot rule, he overrules. And for some of us, we might be intersecting a point in our life where God kind of overrules our decisions that are leading us astray, and we're wondering why it's not going good, but yet we haven't allowed God to be a part of it in the first place. God wants to be in the rule there. The truth is we, we don't get in trouble again when we plan, but it's when we disregard God. And it, God in his perfect timing wants to guide us through. So I want to encourage you, don't miss out on God's call in your life because you're trying to control your life. Reading on James 5, uh, 4.15, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will, we will do this or that. And and so James is saying, I want to challenge you as as Christ followers. I know you know how to be religious, but I want to challenge you to go before God and God say, God, is this your will? Not come and say, God, I'm going this road. Are you going to bless it? God, we're going to make this investment. Are you going to bless it? God, I'm going to step into this relationship where this person doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. I hope you're going to bless it. No, he's saying, is this God's will? And move forward. It's kind of like this. I grew up on a farm. Anybody who knows me knows about it because I've shared hundreds of illustrations about growing up on a farm in Florida. I absolutely love what you know, my parents raised me. I didn't at the time because we worked out in our Orange Grove Infirmary, and that was just life. But here's something I know. I remember almost every meal at dinner time we, we had, the family was always together. We always sat down at the table together. It is just what we did. My mom taught piano. Um, my dad uh, worked for the county as zoning, heading up zoning, but he also worked on our farm. But whatever happened, we all kind of, everything stopped and we had dinner together because it was a plan. They, they purposely brought us together. And I remember that time together. But here's what I also know would happen. My parents were so intentional about it that, but if I ever came in and I said, hey, mom, dad, right at the beginning of dinner, and they're setting the table, putting things on the table. Mom was very formal. We had the dishes on the table, and you serve yourself out of the dishes, all that kind of stuff. If I came in and basically said, mom, dad, hey, um, my friends are going out. I'll see you later. Bye. (laughs) Heck to the no. Um, You would have a message from Nick up here today going, we don't have anybody to preach this Sunday. Uh, we, I don't know why, but we, we're going to have something. Because I wouldn't exist, man. My life would no longer be here if I told my parents that. Now, here, here's the alternative. I would go to my parents, and this did happen many times. I'd go to mom and dad. Hey, mom, dad, uh, my friends are doing such and such. May I please go join them? And often what my parents would say is, yeah, let's eat dinner together and then go and be back by blah, 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 curfew, all right? That's what happened back in my day. You actually had to be in home at a certain time, whatever, and we had to ask permission. It was not tell my parents what I'm doing and go do it. Now, some of y'all, I know it's a different generation, but I believe, unfortunately, we missed not not a formality with God, but a respect and surrender to God. Going, God, I I surrender to the fact you've served dinner. Um, It's okay with you if I do this. Yes, by all means, but sometimes he'll change things because he wants me to enjoy his presence. I, are you missing the call of God? But it, let me move on to the second thing is this. Don't miss what God is now saying because you're holding on to what he has once said. Don't miss what God is now saying because you're holding on to what he once said. Where I go with this and where, where I see in this passage, and again, James saying instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we'll do this and that. This is in essence called sanctification. It's when God speaks, he speaks to your life and he calls you to something, but then he continues to speak. Just as we read Isaiah 55, 11, uh, 10 and 11, God's word speaks whenever we spend in it. Are you spending time with God on a daily basis? Are you spending time listening to God's voice? Because here's what I know about God. And guys, I experienced this fresh and new, and I still struggle with this too. Whenever I listen to God's word, it's always calling me to a next step. And sometimes it's not even correlated to a Bible study I'm doing right then. But sometimes it's something that even he spoke in my life years ago or or months ago. But the Holy Spirit speaks. Uh, Are you, again, are you missing 
what God is now saying because you're holding on to what he once said. Let me put it this way. For, for many in here, you've come to a point of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have, I praise God you have. If you haven't, Romans, is a, I lay out all the time, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says this. He says, if you confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It's, that's a simple step that Paul says, this is what you must do to be saved. For, for those that have received and surrendered your life to Christ, praise God. But I want to ask you, what has he called you to or said in your life since that time? Does that make sense? Because what I see happen so often, and this is painful, what I see happen so often is a person received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they're excited about it, they're happy about it, maybe they'll go and take a step of baptism or whatever else, but then that's it. There's nothing more. What, what is Christ saying now? It, it, you might be holding on to what he once said, okay, yes, I, I want you to receive Christ, but what is he calling you to now? What, what's that next step of obedience he's calling you to? Guys, I've been following Christ a long time. I received Christ when I was 16. And the older I get, the more I find that God has more steps, more steps. It doesn't just end, all right? When you get old as, as dirt as, as me, I mean, you, you start realizing that there's some new step of obedience every day. My prayer daily is simply, God, I pray I'm obedient to your appointments today. Because I know God has appointments that are not on my calendar. Um, and the thing is, if I fill up my calendar too much, I schedule God out. And I have to be careful of that. I'm talking about the appointments of the lady at Walmart that you're going to share with. I'm talking about, you know, the, the person you see that at work that really annoys the fool out of you. And every one of you have somebody that you know that's like that. If you don't know somebody like that, I'm sorry, you're that person. But anyway, we, we, we have those, those people that, you know, God has placed in our life that, that we're called to minister to, to share Christ with. What are you doing? Are you moving forward on those things? For some, let's be real, we hold on to what he once said, um, and I know this from having worked with a lot of people that have come in from churches that have been hurt, that, that have been deeply hurt at another church. If that's you, man, and, and I believe this church probably has plenty of people that you've been there. You've been hurt, and, and uh, somebody, some hypocrite at another church, just flat out, you know, they did something wrong. And I get it, and, and I know it hurts, I really do. And I just want to encourage you, welcome to New Passion. It's full of a bunch of hypocrites too, okay? Because to be honest, that's who we all are. I'm just being real. We, we all are hypocrites. I, I am the worst. But with that, I want to encourage you. Um, when God has maybe told you, you can take, you know, pull back. I want you to heal. I want you to recover. And, and you know what I'm saying. There, there are times where God gives us a season in life where we need to heal. I get that. But where the danger comes... It's when that season becomes a lifestyle and we just stay pulled back. I'm not going to re-engage. I'm not going to rejoin. I'm not going to because. And for many of us, we, we know that we're there. I want to encourage you. Don't miss out on what God is now saying because of something he once said, something he once told you. I, I, I harassed Nick um, about asking me to preach on this back in January. He asked me to preach on this passage, and I was so honored because I love Nick. But, but with that, um, this specific passage, and I believe you'll understand why in just a second, I, I told him yeah, he has a real great sense of humor. Um, because see, my wife and I, in, in 1998, began praying. Uh, God had put on my heart about a mission church. And we began praying, doing student ministry, and seeing God bless. And our student ministry was thriving, just very, very, very blessed with what God was doing. And um, but God put on our heart to do this. And I'm like, I can't do that. I like, I know how to order pizza really good. All right, I, I can do student ministry really good. You know, God's blessed, and I had, and He surrounded me with. It. Let me put it better. God's surrounded me with amazing adults and college students that do ministry real good. I just know how to coordinate them, and, and they just do a phenomenal job. But anyway, we started praying about it, and God put in our hearts to trust him with it. In 2004, we stepped out to launch Greenbrier Church, and uh, it was a humongous step of faith because we had no finances. We had nothing. God just put our heart, this is something we're to do, we're to trust him and do this. And it was, I mean, it was huge. And I remember even trying to, her, my, my bride's uh, parents, are, he's a CPA, and, and my parents even just kind of telling him we're going to do this. And I think all of them were like, Okay, and your financial plan is, you know, it's kind of uh, 
we're going to trust God. He's going to do it. And, and the incredible thing about it is that they were so supportive and, and always were from beginning to end. And, and in that, we saw God uh, do a mighty, mighty work. I got to know some of your staff and different ones in here and just so blessed to serve with them. But in that, we saw God save hundreds. And we saw, I believe, even into thousands. I don't know how many. We saw many of those be baptized. We saw many marriages restored that were crumbling. Um, I, I had weeks where I would be meeting with couple after couple after couple and just shooting straight with you. I'd tell them, guys, I took college and seminary classes and counseling, but I'm not licensed and I'm probably going to mess you up worse than you are. But they still come and we just saw God just do amazing things in, in lives. We saw people dealing with drug addictions come off. We just saw amazing things happen. But that said, fast forward, we were portable the majority of our time, setting up and breaking down. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you've been there with new pastors. It is hard. It is hard when you're setting up in a school week after week after week. It's raining. It's hot. You go in sweat. I would go in. I'd take a change of clothes with me. And by the time we loaded in, set up everything, I was just covered with sweat, all right? And, and basically have to go change clothes and then get ready for the message, et cetera. We did that week after week after week and, and for years. But all of a sudden, we started, we ran into some bumps and kinks and challenges kind of over the years. And, and we saw growth, but but all of a sudden, we saw different people step away. And man, it became, you know, it started becoming personal. It's just like, this hurts. God, this hurts. We came to the year 2020, the beginning of 2020, and we literally met with our church body and said, um, this is hard to share with y'all, but I want us to pray about, should we merge with another church? God, we still see, have a great body here, and, and God's provided the finances, but health-wise, is it better for us to pray about this? And then something called COVID came along. We started praying, and that came along. So we went ahead with video services like y'all did, and we did that all year, and, and I, I loved what we did. I mean, I actually thought the production quality of everything was, it was fun. I loved it, you know, and did videos every week. I'd do them out at the lake and all different places doing the message, and, and I really enjoyed it, but I missed being with our body. But as the summer progressed, and we saw things happening at the school, and we weren't able to go and set up and break down as before, really convicted with something painful. Started praying and fasting. Met with my wife, met with our leadership team, just going, okay, God, what's going to honor you? All said and done in November, we came to November, and like I said, sparing you a lot of the details in between, um, came to November and got it convicted that we needed to lead our body through our community groups for our community groups to merge into different churches, knowing that the needs of each community group were very vastly different. You know, one church might connect here, but another church connects over there. We had people from North Augusta all the way to Appling coming, and it's just like, and even Thompson, it's like, what, what's going to honor you, God? That's, that's what we want to do. And, and with it, you know, I share this. It's one of the hardest decisions my wife and I ever made. But here's the crazy part. We had a peace that passes understanding about it. We could not understand. We prayed about this for six stinking years. Six. And my wife going, it was six. It was about how long it took you to propose to me, that kind of thing. Anyway, we prayed about it for six years. We ran for 16 years. We saw lots of lives changed. It's not like we were doing bad stuff, you know, corrupt stuff. Bad. I mean, we were proclaiming the name of Jesus where we went. But in the end, we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's the step we needed to take. And we knew that it meant my wife and I stepping back into that uncertainty we stepped in in 2004, just going, it's up to you, God. It's, it's you. We got, you know, over the last couple months, you got together my resume and polished it up. How many of you have, like, taken 30 years between when you played with your resume? That's a long time, all right? I mean, it, it's like it's crazy at my age, you know, again, in my late 30s, uh, to be doing my resume. But here's the deal. We, we, in the process, we began uh, Connect Hope. We're beginning it, still forming it. And the goal and the purpose is to minister to ministers and ministries, to invest in them, to see them thriving, and, and to help plant churches and, and resource churches getting together. It's still forming, doing a lot of work, been working with lawyers and all bylaws changing, et cetera. But I don't see it paying the bills anytime soon. I mean, it basically, so I'll be, I don't know, you may see me at, at Walmart or at you know, McDonald's, I don't flip in burgers, I don't know, whatever, whatever it takes, I just want to see God glorified. That's our bottom line. 
But here's the thing where I believe some of us are, that again, don't, again, mess what God is saying because you're holding on to what he once said. I wonder for some of us, if you're holding on to what he once said because you currently are navigating a loss of a dream. My wife and I can relate with you. Some of you, I feel like I told Nick I'm an expert on this or becoming an expert, and apparently God wants me to learn a lot more. I used to think I knew this passage. Oh, I know it a lot more now because God's telling me you had no clue. And the problem is I'm concerned that I really have no clue still, and God has a lot more to teach me. But I wonder how many of you out there are in the same place. There's a loss of a dream and something you've been navigating. You believe God told you at one point in time this relationship was going to keep going, and it hasn't. You prayed about kids, and this has not happened. You prayed for this child, and that child is not going anywhere near what you prayed. Your career, you, you had it out. You said, God, we're going to glorify you with this, and, and it's, it's not. Are you holding on to what God once said, and, and you're missing out on what he's currently saying? I want to encourage you, don't, don't stop. The, the story's not over. Maybe what you're experiencing, that doesn't mean the end of what God's doing. What my wife and I have learned and, and we're still learning is, is very simply just all of our plans, open hands. All of our plans, open hands. I thought we were doing that with the church from the beginning, but, but I'm learning a whole new meaning to it. I want to keep on going here, guys. One of my favorite passages as well, I got a lot of these, but Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God calls us to be a living sacrifice, and when we are, we're going to experience the power of God telling us the next step we need to take. We can hold on to that, not something in the past. I was once obedient. God, you told me this once, but what is God telling you now? God calls you and I to be a living sacrifice, but one of my all-time heroes, spiritual heroes, is a guy named Oswald Chambers, and Oswald Chambers said this uh, in my utmost first highest. He said, again, the only problem with a living sacrifice is they tend to crawl off the altar. And I wonder for how many of us that's the problem. Maybe at one time we were placing our life on the altar, we are holding on to what God said, but we haven't moved forward with just being that living sacrifice. And saying, God, please teach me whatever you call me to do, I want to be obedient with it. God told us in 1998 to pray about this. God told us in 2004 to step out in faith, and we did. And we do not understand what has happened, but at the same time we have a peace about it. And I want to challenge you, what is God telling you now? Not what did he tell you 10 years ago? Five years ago, what is he tell, even last week, what is he telling you now about following him in obedience? Again, for, for some of us, if we're honest, we're writing out our relationship with Christ based on our past obedience, not our present surrender. We're writing out a relationship with Christ Jesus based on our, our, our past obedience, not our present surrender. I want to challenge and encourage you, daily surrender, daily Got it, got them yours, daily, daily surrender. Let's keep going. Again, James 4.16 says this, as it, is you, as it is, you boast about your arrogant schemes. All of such boasting is evil. And it's a continuation of verses 13 and 14 is what he's doing. He's just saying, who are you to boast and think you can plan what you want to? Your life is a vapor. But he's basically saying all boasting is evil. But he also, since he knows he's talking to a Jewish audience, he, he basically, that are Christians, he refers to Proverbs 27, which all of them would have known because they would have studied Solomon's words. Proverbs 27.1 says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what that day may bring. But let's be honest, none of us are arrogant, are we? None of us get our own way in our household, right? No spouse basically demands something. No child in here has basically told, you know, rebelled when their mom or dad said, you need to be home by 10 o'clock. No, none of, us, none of us are arrogant in such a way that we think we know better. We all are that way. At least, okay, I'm not that way, but I know y'all are. Anyway, no, keep going. So with this, so we can confirm, basically we confirm our arrogant schemes anytime we move forward without seeking God. That's basically it. We confirm our arrogant schemes anytime we move forward in life, especially the big things, but even more, the small things, that, that we move forward without seeking God in life. So, so what am I saying? Am I saying that, that today, afterwards, you need to sit in the parking lot in your van, and y'all need to pray, Lord God Almighty, should we go to Steak and Shake or Culver's? 
We're not moving this van till you tell it. No, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, all right? Uh, for some, maybe that, that's the level, level of obedience you need to go. But here's what I know about obedience. You know, God's not going to tell you one of those. He's going to tell you Cracker Barrel. Let's be real. Come on, anyway. So w- with that, it's, it's breaking down our obedience to a point of saying this. We're spending so much time with God that little decisions, we already know what he wants because we've been spending time with him. It's, it's kind of unique. When you're spending that time with God on a, a regular daily basis, you and I know how to process little decisions. And, and they become natural. I'm, of course I'm going to honor God with this. But when we're not spending time pursuing Christ, then even little decisions, it becomes a debate. Do I honor God with this or not? Do I have this or not? I mean, it, you walk out of a store and you see the person in front of you drop a 20. If, if you're not spending time with God, it can be a debate of, do I keep this? Or if you're spending time with Christ, this can be a no-brainer. Of course you're going to keep it. No, you're going you're gonna to catch the person. Here's your 20. I mean, because morality and, and ethics are, are, are no problem. Because God is our, you know, your foundation. He's your author. He's your guide in every situation you're taking. So anyway, we keep going with that. Let me move on with, with this uh, daily time in, in God's word and prayer. Uh, actively listening to God makes a difference. And I even share something with you. I want to encourage you, if you don't spend time in God's word, um, there, there's the Bible app is a great tool to bring up verses, a verse that, uh, a tool that uh, a friend of mine, one of our staff actually shared in the years ago that I use uh, each week. It's called Fighter Verses, and I think it's like $1.99 to get the app. But each week it pops up a verse and it helps you memorize. It has these little quizzes and little games and whatever else, but, but it gets you to memorize God's word. And every, every morning when I wake up, that, that verse pops up on my screen. And so it's kind of a reminder, it, whether you use Bible app or some other tool, are you spending time in God's word? I would love to talk to you about soap. I, it's a, a Bible study method I've been using for, I don't know, 12, 13 years now, but it's, it's one of my all-time favorite, just digging, walking through God's ver- word one or two, three verses at a time. Spend time in God's word daily. But anyway, let's keep going. Verses 17 says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And, and of course, this, this flashes back to what y'all was talked about in here from James 1.22. It's just a reflection. He's just repeating. He basically says, guys, if you didn't listen to the beginning of my letter, I'm going to restate it. In James 1.22, he said this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And it leads to, to the third point. just want to emphasize this. Don't miss what God is now saying because you've not obeyed what he has said. Don't miss what God is saying because you have not obeyed what he has already said. For some of us, I, I, I wonder if right now the struggle that maybe we're having in a relationship with God, maybe it's with our relationship with our spouse, maybe it's with family, maybe it's other elements of our life, if that struggle comes from the fact we've not obeyed what he's already said. He's told us, he's spoken to us through the Holy Spirit, and he's called us to obedience. And maybe that obedience is this. Maybe it's to confess a sin. It's one thing to confess to God, and for some of us, confessing with God. When we confess to God, there's an agreement. What we're doing is we're agreeing with God. God, I agree with you. This is wrong. But for some today, maybe that next step of obedience is to confess to your spouse or your parents or your kids, that's humbling. But we're not going to be able to move forward until we do. Don't miss out on God speaking in your life now, today, what he's saying now, today, by not obeying what he's already told you. As God called called you and, and challenged you to ask forgiveness of someone, has God called you and challenged you to extend forgiveness to someone. This last year, I've learned a lot about that as well. God had burdened me just to different areas, different relationships where I am guilty. I am at fault. Nobody else. I've made decisions that are getting wrong, and I have to agree with God, and I have to take the next step of obedience there. For some, what is this? Has God called you and your spouse to go get counseling? Well, we don't need counseling. Seriously? I wonder how many of us, that's what God is calling us, to take that step and get help. Maybe it's to break a habit and you're going to need help. They do celebrate recovery here, and I'm so thankful they do. And just that element of having people walk with you through that battle. Maybe for some, it's taking a step of baptism. 
You've surrendered your life to Christ, but the next step after receiving Christ for everybody is the same, and that's to be baptized. That's what God's Word says. And I know, I know you were baptized, you are sprinkled as a child. I get it. I had the same happen to me. I was told by some that I peed on the minister or whatever else, but anyway, as a baby. So, it, you know, but whatever. Here, here's the deal. Are you going to obey what God says or basically tradition? Are you going to step into what God is calling for, for others, maybe it's the element of serving. And here's been a challenge for many. Yes, COVID gave us the excuse to, let's watch Pastor Nick, you know, and we turn on the TV and we can watch him and we don't have to serve, we don't have to do anything. You know, you got your coffee, okay, we got everybody got their donut and their PJs, but let's, let's watch them. And we can do that, yes, everybody was in the same boat, but as things free up, again, I wonder how many of us, the struggle is, we're missing out on what God is saying because we haven't obeyed what he's already told us to serve. Yes, we had a season. All of us had a season where we pulled back, but what about now? What is he saying now? Has he called you to serve? Use your gifts and talents. When we had Green Bar Church, one of the things that we often did is I challenged people this. If you can't serve here, if you can't tithe here, and even our leadership would rip on me about this, and teasingly, but lovingly, but if you can't serve here, you can't tithe here, please let me help you find a church where you can. Please. And I mean that with full sincerity, no sarcasm. And, and I, I mean it. I always meant it. If, if you cannot serve here and tithe here, then, then let's help you find a church where you can. Because see, none of us, if we're claimed to be Christ followers, we're not called to sit in a back pew. Nobody. We're called to step up and serve Jesus. Even when it comes to tithing, uh, I know for some that that's a holdback. You know, some of you, maybe you don't tithe, maybe you quote-unquote give. Why give money? That's a tithe. No, it, it, it's more than just kind of putting a little tip in the bucket. You know, if you really want a tip, yeah, 15, 20%, that's great. But, but here's the thing. For some, we don't tithe because, well, Chuck, you have to understand, that's an Old Testament term. And uh, Okay, if you're, let's go ahead and go here. If you're having to argue it, you're making an excuse for disobedience. If you're arguing, you're even arguing in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm not going to listen to this guy anymore. Here's the thing. I would rather you be obedient and experience the power of God working through it. I would rather you be obedient to what God is telling you to do than holding back on a blessing God wants to give. See, I always encourage people in our church to tithe, not because I cared about what they gave, but because I wanted them to experience the power of God blessing their life. And if you really want to go the Old Testament argument, let's go ahead and go there. Yes, Old Testament talked about 10%. If you want to do New Testament, that's everything. Everything. New Testament is tied to everything. Everything is God's. That's what New Testament is. It's not a percentage. It's everything is God is God is going to allow me to be the steward of the remaining 90% or 80% or 70%. That's what New Testament tithing is, giving is. I even had a guy one time, um, Green Bar Church, that came up, and basically, he had just gotten a, a new job, and he was making, he even told me, he said, you know, I've, I've had a six-figure income, but I'm actually getting a lot more now with my income. He said, I'm just going to ask you to pray for me. He said, let me, let me go and do this. I don't really like what you've been talking about, the tithing thing, but I'm going to ask you to pray that God bless me as I make these new steps, and we make these job transitions, et cetera. And, and I said, okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, now tell me what you're saying about tithing. He goes, I don't believe Really, you, you believe God expects me, with the amount I'm going to be making, to tithe on that? I mean, I don't think that's practical. I don't think it's realistic. Then he goes on to say, I will ask you, though, please pray for me. I said, I gladly will. And I put my arm around him, and again, I remember exactly, I can see exactly where we were standing in my mind. I put my arm on him, and in, in all sincerity prayed, God, please, I ask you to bless my brother and change his heart on what it is to give to you, to sacrifice to you, to tithe to you. Um, but God, if his heart doesn't change, please lower his salary to a point where he can. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> he backed out of that so quick, and he was mad at me, and that did, that did happen, and he was furious with me. He goes, why would you pray that? I said, because it's what I believe. I believe that I believe God wants to bless you incredibly, but you've got to make a choice if you're going to surrender everything to God. Have you obeyed what God said are you missing out on that blessing? With that, I, I know I experienced um, a huge blessing. My parents, uh, when I was 
heading off to college, my mom gave me and my dad gave me uh, my utmost for his highest Oswald Chambers I mentioned earlier, uh, a favorite devotional. If you haven't, it's you know, written back in the early 1900s. But with it, um, my mom said, I just want you to have this as you go off to college. And it was so sweet. Um, and at the same time, what's unique about it is I grew up in a church-going household, but we weren't all Christ followers at the time. We went to church, but we hadn't surrendered our lives to Jesus. So she went off, went off to college, and my mom gave this to me. And, and a little bit later, she called up, have you gone through you know, re- reading up most for his highest? Oh, yeah, Mom. Yeah, Mom, I'm, I'm reading it. Da, 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 going on. A little bit later, have you read it? Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm reading it. L- let me go ahead and fast forward. That was the beginning of college. I went to college, finished up college, and worked a couple years. Then I went to seminary. I started digging into utmost for his highest in seminary because one of my professors, we had daily, a, a weekly devotional. And I was going through utmost for his highest, and I got, it was somewhere in October. This would have been my fall semester in fr- freshman year if I'd read it earlier on. Got in fall in October, oh, turned the page, and a crisp $100 bill was there. I would have gotten at least six years earlier if I'd obeyed and done what my mom and dad had requested of me. And, and I share that to say just kind of uniquely, I wonder how many of us right now were missing out on the blessing of God doing a mighty work because we're holding off on obedience on something so simple. I know it seems painful. God, I, I know it seems painful. But what if God has a blessing that he's wanting to pour out on you just beyond belief if you're willing to step back and say, God, I surrender this to you. Let me, let me keep flying just a, a few Closing things, I know with this, um, I've met generous people that literally have nothing at all, but they've said everything they have is God's. They'll give you their car. And they don't, that's their only car. It's like, no, it's God's. I mean, you take it. I've worked with people like that, and it's, it's embarrassing because I'm like, no, I, I can't take your stuff because I know that we have 10 times what you have, but they've learned what it is to obey God with everything they have. Here's something, John 12, as we pull it together, 24 and 25, this is from the message. This is a passage that has meant so much to us and and the truth of it, and I believe it's going to mean some to you that are struggling right now. You've had a loss of a dream, some struggles that are going on. Listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried... It sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. See, that's God's love. And I believe whatever you're walking through, that's what God wants to do. It's a matter of you and I recognizing it's not worth holding on to our dreams, our hopes, our purpose. God's primary concern is not your happiness. It's not it, it, because the truth is his son's death and resurrection was for your holiness. God's, God's purpose, his, his concern, his goal is not your happiness. If that was so, then he would have looked at Jesus and go, I want you to be happy as you die on the cross. I'm, God, I'm not too happy about this. Sometimes taking steps following Christ, it's not about our happiness, but ultimately it's about our holiness, where God wants to take us. I know that, again, in discipleship, ultimately, it's what Jesus Christ, if you and I are going to be the disciples he calls us to be, it's this truth. It's coming from Luke 9, and it it simply says this. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me daily, because you can't do your own plans and carry the cross. You and I can't do our own plans and, and hold on to our cross. It just does not work that way. Or as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he died, again, uh, standing up against Hitler in in Nazi Germany as a theologian and pastor. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. My prayer to you is that we're willing to take that step of dying. I'm going to ask just to give a kind of a final practical, um, taking it home, Brandon, if you wouldn't mind. I I want you to see this, this rope as this is your life. James is talking about, again, your life. And what are you doing with the plans of your life? How far are you going with your life? For, for some of us, your life maybe won't extend quite this long if you do eat too much at, uh, basically, at Steak and Shake and Culver's. But, but here's the deal. This is your life as it's stretched out and wrapping around the room here. I wonder how many of us, as we look at our life, we're wondering, okay, what point am I at, at and how long will it last? Well, the truth be known, this is what you're seeing here is only a fraction, even wrapping around the room here, this is only a fraction of your life in eternity. 
Because the truth be known, this is your life this side of eternity, the red. And I saw actually Francis Chan share this years ago, and, and I've seen it in different forms and fashions, but it just stood out so much to me just how realistic it is. This is our life, guys, the red. This is eternity, and we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. So why do we spend so much time investing in my plans, my hopes, my dreams, and, oh, God, uh, yeah, I'll consider you when I get to heaven? Seriously? Why would we not take this little bit of life, this vapor life, as James says in 414? Why would we not invest this in this? Well, why would we not spend more time working on this, being prepared for this? Because one thing I've found over and over in this life is simply this, what you know, and some of y'all have experienced it recently. None of us know how long this life's going to last. Eternity's forever. Why would we not spend more time than we have in this life invested in this? I want to read a closing passage and, and just pulling it together uh, with this 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles that are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is so temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I want to encourage you I want to challenge you as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't miss out on what God has for you because we're so fixated on this little bit of life we have now. Why not today take every next step Jesus Christ calls you to take? You will never, ever regret it. Guys, I keep uh, one of these in my pocket and or in my backpack every day. It's just kind of a simple reminder to me, just going, dang. Okay, make sure to make it count because my life is short. I don't know how much longer I have. But I want to encourage you. Again, even like I said, we don't know. We are still making sense. of. We, we're never going to make sense of what happened with our church, but I do know this. Our God is faithful. And he's going to be glorified. And he has blessed us so richly on this journey. We don't want to miss anything he has in store in the future. My prayer is today that, that your story isn't finished. Move. Your story's not over. As long as you're breathing, move. My wife and I have had times where we've been like, okay, this hurts so deeply, and we have a choice. Either we can sit here and mourn, or we can get up and move and say, God, be glorified. What do you want me to do today? And that's been our choice, and I praise God. He's blessed over and over and over again. Let me pray for us. My Jesus, again, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you, God. You've called us to live recklessly abandoned to you. I thank you, God, right now, you wanting us to take next steps following you and how I pray, God, we will be obedient to do that. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for loving us like you do. I pray, God, for any soul in here that needs to surrender their life to you today as Lord and Savior, you will give them that strength to step up and take that step. God, for anyone who needs to ask forgiveness or extend forgiveness, you will give them that strength today. For some that need to confess to you, God, to others, a sin or a struggle they have, may they, you again give them that strength to take that step. Or God, others need to take a step of obedience following you, whatever that is. Jesus Christ, may we be obedient, be obedient while we're still alive in this vapor life. In your precious name, my Savior, my Lord, in Christ's name, amen. I want to encourage you as, as the worship team leads here that you meet with some of the pastors and the team here. We have... Uh, right in back, some of our team that are going to be standing there. If you want to pray with somebody, you have a next step you want to discuss, I'll be back there as well. Um, I encourage you, whatever next step Christ has called you to take, do it. You'll never regret it. Thank you all. Surrounding me, let it pray.
Shut 